I'm only giving you this one example at this stage. I shall feed more to you later on. But you've got to ask yourself why it is that I, David Irving, come along and say this to you, and why my front door is sledgehammered and my printing works are set on fire, and why I'm subjected to all kinds of psychological and other terror, and why your own academic historians don't do it. Well, the answer is, it lies in the nature of things, ladies and gentlemen. There's a difference between historians. There's is Gib Zotter and Zotter, as the Swabians say. There's these and there's those. There's the academic historians like them, and there's the capitalist historians like myself. And I use the word capitalist in an entirely neutral sense. Capitalist in as much as I have to make a living out of writing history, which means I have to have my books continually published, which means I can't afford to make mistakes. If anybody can come along and say, David Irving, you've got egg all over your face now, we've got you, we can trip you up this time, you've fallen for a phony document, or you're, you've overreached yourself, or you really can't substantiate this allegation or hypothesis, I'm finished. The next time, or, or the, uh, uh, the very latest, the time after that, the publishers will say, David Irving, I'm afraid your books are unreliable, we can't afford to publish you. Of course, they're saying that now, but for a different reason. They're saying it because I found out the things that will get them, their own publishers, like Doubleday, a bad name with the American marketers, and of course with their own commercial interests in the United States. My books are written with immense capital investment. That means I do research all the way around the world. I write in the Churchill biography. I looked in the Menzies diaries down in Canberra. I looked at the Smuts papers in Pretoria. I looked at the Mackenzie King papers here in Ottawa. I looked in all the federal archives and all the presidential archives in the United States. I spent 10 years writing it. I've invested perhaps 80 or 90,000 pounds in the research alone in the confident belief that when the book is sold, A, it will go down in history as the reliable standard work, and B, it will probably, on balance, make back enough money, but even if it doesn't earn enough money back, I don't really mind, because in the meantime, I write other books, like Rommel, which make enough money to pay for the big, really politically serious books. So I do the kind of research that, and I don't hold this against the academic historians, I do the kind of research they can't afford. They haven't got the time, they haven't got the money, and, of course, they haven't got the guts. They haven't got the guts to write the truth, and they haven't got the guts to find a publisher who will publish it, even if they do write the truth. And this is my most serious allegation against the academic body of historians that they are not prepared to risk the chance they're on. And this, of course, is a process that they've been involved in ever since they arrived at university, because those of you who've been to university will recognize what I'm about to say. You arrive at university with all the youthful idealism and eagerness of the freshman, and the first thing that's, that's thrust into your hands is the set list, a list of set books to read. You're given a list of set books to read by your professor or by your tutor on your particular subject, church history, medieval history, whatever it is. And the set books you read from the left to the right, and when you've read the set books, of course, you know how to think. And you begin that insidious process which we can call self-censorship. Nobody's telling you what to write, but a little voice inside you says, write like that because you'll get good marks. And a little voice also tells you over the next few weeks, if you haven't learned it at the beginning, you'd better write that way because that's the, professor, the way the professor or your tutor wants you to think. And so this little process of set book censorship begins. It's, it's a rut that gets deeper and deeper. The student gets deeper and deeper into this rut over his three or four year course until finally he emerges at the end, convinced he's learned how to research history and he's learned a great deal about his particular subject. But as the rut has got deeper, of course, he can no longer see out over the edges laterally and convince himself that there's no other possible explanation for some of the great mysteries of past or present or recent history. And of course, there are other solutions the whole time. I shall offer other solutions to you in a minute about these great mysteries. But let us look at the professors. Why do they do that? Why are they also following along in the same rut, this self-perpetuating rut along which history has advanced? And the answer is, of course, the professors have learned the simple truth that no professor has yet been sacked for swimming with the stream. And so they continue to swim along with the stream because they read the newspapers like everybody else. They see on television what happens to somebody who stands up and disbelieves. The disbelievers, whether they say that the earth is not flat or whatever they say, the disbelievers have a rougher ride than the believers. And so on balance, people prefer to believe. The, the stream is self-perpetuating. And we've seen in, in our own country here in Canada what happens to the disbelievers. Sometimes a very rough and harsh fate indeed, threats of deportation, arrest, eviction from their job, hounding, harassing and terrorization that goes on when people begin to disbelieve in public. So you begin to understand why the writing of history is a self-perpetuating job. The first professor comes along, and I've told this to you before, but I'll tell it again because it can't be repeated often enough. The first professor comes along and writes some little tiny hypothesis. He ventures this hypothesis, which he half thinks to himself may be untrue, but he ventures it, he, he flies a balloon. 
And this balloon becomes bigger and bigger until it becomes a gigantic Goodyear blimp floating around with enough people quoting it and backing it up with enough hot air that this blimp floats around. It's got its own life. This, this balloon, these theories, these hypotheses, they have their own kind of charmed existence of their own. They're no longer attached to the ground. They're not tethered to any documents or substantial evidence at all. They just, they, they survive because enough people believe them to be true. It's rather like the fairy in, um, in uh, Peter Pan, you remember? Do you believe in fairies? And I'm using fair in the old-fashioned sense, not in the sense of gay or whatever. <laughs> Do you we all have to believe, unfortunately, in, in the other kind of fairy? Do you believe in fairies? The whole audience roars, yes, and then the fairy's light comes on again. And so it is with the historians. She floats this little hypothesis. Do you believe this hypothesis? The entire body of academic historians says, yes, I believe, I believe. And so this hypothesis becomes invulnerable, unchallengeable. Professor Martin, Bo Martin Broschart in Munich, the famous Nazi hunting historian in Germany, Professor Martin Broschart in Munich, he writes a tiny hypothesis about something, about Auschwitz, about the high Holocaust, or whatever. He's quoted by Professor Eberhard Jeckel, a sanguine, serious, somber-looking, pipe-smoking historian in Stuttgart. Professor Hillgruber in Cologne quotes Jeckel, Professor Jakobsen in Bonn quotes Hillgruber, and so it goes on, they're all quoting each other. Four professors all saying the same thing, it must be true. And if you're a historian, you know that you've got to be quoted by the other professors, otherwise you are not writing the truth. And so they all go around this jolly club, all quoting each other. It's a kind of philosophical context, a, a concept as a historian. The kind of philosophical concept, unless you're being quoted by other historians, you don't exist. You remember like that Immanuel Kant, like the tree in the forest, which doesn't exist because you didn't hear it fall? If you're a historian who's not being quoted by anybody else, you don't really exist. And so they all go around apprehensively quoting each other in the knowledge that they too will be quoted in turn, and so they begin to exist as historians. Brochart has blown the initial... This, yeah, I mean, you've got four historians all saying the same thing. Five historians, ten historians, all quoting each other, twenty historians. It must be true. If twenty people say the same thing, it's got to be true. And so history begins to take off like that Goodyear blimp. It takes off and it leads an existence of its own. Twenty dogs, twenty historians, twenty dogs, all chasing around in a circle, sniffing each other's tail. And you've got this busy, this circle of historians all spinning around and round and round, generating an impression of furious, frantic activity. But of course, they're just spinning around and around in the same place and not making any progress. They're not making any progress in the sense of historical research. They're all in, standing in the same place. Or put it another way, Professor Martin Brochard has blown that initial little balloon, the little soap bubble that starts it all off about the Holocaust or whatever. And along comes Jekyll and puts hot air in, and Jakobsen puts more hot air in, and Hillgruber puffs it bigger, and the balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and the soap bubble gets bigger and begins to shimmer and wobble and become unstable, and they get apprehensive that at any moment some idiot, some idiot, some appall appalling, in incorrigible, heretical idiot may come along and, and prick that soap bubble. And I am that prick. Again and again, again and again, I come along with the documents and I challenge them to prove me wrong. And they can't prove me wrong because I had the documents on my side. I've spoken to big audiences everywhere around the world, especially in Germany over the last year. And everywhere I go, the only way they can smash me is by literally smashing up my meetings. I spoke in Germany, for example, seven times in August, just before I set off for South Africa. And of those seven meetings, three were cancelled, rained out by the communists, the halls barricaded, riot police couldn't get the audience in. The audiences which were to take my audience to the alternative hall, which we rented, of course, we're not fools. The audiences found that the coaches had been set on fire, the tyres slapped. This is the battle for the freedom of speech in Germany. The four weeks I spent in South Africa were peaceful compared with that. And I'll tell you about that later on. The 20,000 people I spoke to there are not the slightest trouble. I travelled from coast to coast, from northern frontier to the southernmost tip of the African continent, and I saw not the slightest sign of travel. Not in the white towns, not in the black townships, nowhere. I'm telling you that because for four weeks I expected to see something. You don't even see the second order signs of trouble in South Africa, like police stand. I see more signs of trouble in the, around, in the streets around the halls where I'm due to speak in Germany than I ever saw in the whole of South Africa in four weeks travelling over the whole country. That is the truth. And of course you're all being deceived about that. And I'm going to come back at the end of my talk and tell you about that. You see, I told you about Hitler and I told you about Churchill. Why did we have to lie so much during the Second World War? The answer is that we British, in fighting the Second World War, bankrupted the Second World War. Ba bankrupted Britain and the British Empire. We had no money left in 1940 even. By December 1940, there wasn't a bean in the British bank, and we still kept on fighting. In fact, Roosevelt sent an American battleship to Simonstown Naval Base in South Africa to pick up our last remaining gold. He found out that we had 20, 28 million pounds of British gold still in South Africa, and Roosevelt sent an American warship to pick up our last money. 
a most humiliating episode in the entire history of the British Empire, but it was symbolic somehow of the decline and fall over which Winston Churchill personally presided. And if you say, but he had no alternative because we were fighting a desperate war, the answer is, what were we fighting for? And if I ask you that question, you're going to come up with two or three or four different reasons. The first reason was, well, we were fighting for Poland. Well, that's an old-fashioned version, of course. It was true in 1939 that we were fighting for Poland, and very right that we should do so because we did give our word. But Poland vanished by the end of 1939. It vanished without trace, invaded not only by the Nazis, but by our friends, the Soviet Union. From 1939 onwards, nobody is talking anymore about saving Poland. In fact, in 1945, Poland was far worse off than it had been at the end of 1939. And there was no talk of Britain any longer continuing the war on Poland's behalf. When Churchill came to power, the, the war aim became magically changed. We were fighting not because of Poland, that was no longer mentioned. We were fighting to protect the British Empire. And of course, in December 1941, that war aim was abandoned because you're not going to get Roosevelt to fight with the Americans on behalf of the British Empire. So mysteriously, the aim was changed. We were now fighting in order to defeat the devil incarnate. And when you are fighting Beelzebub, when you are fighting the Satan, uh, Satan, when you're fighting the devil, of course you have to commit yourself, you have to invest every single ounce of strength you've got, even if it means destroying your own empire, killing millions of... If the war had ended in June 1940, ladies and gentlemen, as I maintain it should, and I'll explain why in a minute, if we had got out of the war in June 1940, as we could have done, on the most generous terms, if the war had ended in June 1940, 20, 30 million people would not have been killed who were killed in the remaining five years of the war. The all Europe cities which were damaged and bombed and blasted and burned and devastated and ruined in the ensuing five years of war would not have been damaged. And of course, the Holocaust wouldn't have happened, whatever it was. I'm not going to go into what the Holocaust was or wasn't, because I'm not an expert on that, but I can tell you that whatever it was or wasn't, it wouldn't have happened if the war had ended in June 1940. But Winston Churchill wanted the war to continue. Winston Churchill wanted the war to continue, and I'll explain why in a second, and so he fought on for another five years, getting deeper and deeper and deeper into debt in the process, until finally he crawled from the courtroom of history on his hands and knees, but with his hand up and saying, we have won. We have won, when in fact the truth was that the British had lost. If you want to look for the people who are responsible for the Holocaust, and I give this advice to Mr. Simon Wiesenthal himself, you don't have to look further than the bronze statue in Westminster in Parliament Square where Winston Churchill is standing at this moment, because he bears at least a partial share of the blame for the tragedy that befell the Jews in Europe, because Churchill fought the war five years longer than was necessary and provided the smokescreen behind which the tragedy could occur. But of course, people don't like to think that. That is lateral thinking. That is climbing out of the rut. You will not get good marks on your term paper if you write things like that. And that's why you sit here to hear this rather than read the books of the academic historians. Because the academic historians don't do the research. They can't think for themselves. William Manchester, even, when he writes a book about Churchill, as he is at this moment, he goes to a bookshop and he buys 20 books about Churchill and he writes number 21. John Toland, when he writes about Hitler, he can't read German. John Toland borrows 30 books about Hitler and writes book 30, 31. You won't find new thoughts there. They're all just quoting each other. Why do I say that we could have got out of the war in June 1940? People are going to say, and I'm sure fewer people in this room than outside in the street in Toronto would say, Irving, how can you say, how can you spout such rubbish and nonsense and heresy getting out of the war in June 1940 after Britain's streets were a, a, a sea of flames, after you were fighting the devil incarnate, you had to do it, there was no choice, the British Empire was at stake. Well, the answer is Britain's streets weren't a sea of flames. Hitler had, in fact, flatly forbidden any kind of air raids on Britain. There were no bombing raids on British towns. London was completely embargoed until the summer of 1940. But of course, history now is viewed differently through the lenses of the television media of the world. Not one bomb fell on a British town, civilian target, until August 1940, until in fact, September the 6th, 1940, when the first air raids took place on London in retaliation for eight raids by Churchill on Berlin. That is the first truth. The second truth, the ugliest truth of all is, as we find in the archives when we read them, that nowhere is there the slightest evidence that Adolf Hitler threatened Britain or the British Empire. Quite the contrary. He made a peace offer to the British in June 1940. Again in July, he had been hinting at it ever since the 1930s, and he repeated this peace offer right through until 1941, 1942. Rudolf Hess, who flew to Scotland in 1941, brought the peace offer in his pocket, which is why Hess is to this day still in prison, 92 years old in Spandau, incommunicado, 25 years in solitary confinement, not allowed to speak to anybody, allowed to visit once a month from his son to talk about family matters, forbidden to talk about politics, because Hess knows the truth about the peace offer which we, we turned down in 1940. The peace offer to the British Empire, which Hitler made in June 1940, was as follows. I will withdraw all German forces from everywhere in Europe, 
except for the provinces which had always been German and which had been taken away from Germany at the end of the First World War. He didn't want any part of Poland or Czechoslovakia or Norway or France except what had always been German. It was the great German dream. And as for France and Britain, although we had damaged Germany a great deal with our declaration of war and the hostilities since then, he offered to the British in this peace offer, which is in the British files, if you go to the archives now, and it's in the German files, of course, he offered to the British the following terms. I have the greatest admiration for Britain and the British Empire. I want the British Empire to survive in perpetuity and grow larger and larger. If the British Empire should at any time in my lifetime, Hitler's lifetime, be, be threatened by any outside force, including the Japanese, the Russians, the Soviet Union, who were Hitler's own allies, I guarantee that I will provide to the British whatever forces they may ask for to help to throw these aggressors out of the British Empire. That man was our enemy. This was the man we were taught to defend our empire from. And yet we read the secret American papers and we see Roosevelt in his cabinet meetings talking to his cabinet members, people like the Secretary of the Interior, Henry F. Ickes, and saying, my great ambition in life is to see the destruction of the British Empire beginning with India. That man was our ally. Now it begins to get rather confused, doesn't it? When you see why we were fighting the one and taking the alliance of the other, why we were selling up the empire in order to provide the money to buy the guns, the tanks, the ships, the bombs, the bullets, the gallons of gasoline from the Americans, because believe me, they didn't give us one single bullet or gallon of gasoline except that we paid up front for it in cash or kind. I, I, mem I mentioned the battleship to you that the, the Roosevelt sent down to Simonstown to pick up our last cash reserves. When that money ran out, Roosevelt sent Henry Morgenthau's treasury agents around the British bank accounts in Wall Street and elsewhere around the world, sniffing and snooping and, and snuffling to find out where Britain still had a few odd coppers left. Because as he told his own cabinet, I'm going to get every penny out of the British that I can. This was in the early part of 1941. All this altruistic idealism that we're told about now, how the Americans saved civilization and liberty and freedom, what Churchill himself called this unsordid act was in fact the most sordid act that we from the British standpoint can imagine in history. Roosevelt made us give up everything we had before he came to help us. He made us buy the garden hose to put out the famous fire that he talked about in Ada's Beaches. When he found out that we had no money left, he then said to Henry Morgenthau, the British now have to liquidate every asset they have. And it started off with the sale of the Viscose Corporation in 1941, owned by the British in the United States, a big chemical combine, the Viscose Corporation, worth nearly 100 million pounds knocked down for 39 million pounds to the Morgan Bank in New York. An American bank, they bought it dirt cheap. And so it went on, the Venezuelan railroads, the oil fields, the coal mines, everything that the British Empire had established and built up and created by investment and hard work, blood, sweat and toil, if you like, overseas in the previous three or 400 years, we had to sell off in order to raise the funds. And the Americans provided the funds, weren't they kind? You know how it is with a neighbor. You know how it is with a neighbor down the street. Everyone hears he's on hard times bankruptcy staring him in the face but just before he's bankrupted all the friends and neighbors club round and help him and one of the neighbors offers him 50 bucks for his Steinway grand piano and another neighbor offers him 10 bucks for his color stereo TV and so it goes on they all help him and so the Americans helped us British they helped us out of our empire in in the 1941 1942 period until finally we had no assets left and then Len Lease began we sunk deeper and deeper into debt in World War II until finally, at the end of the war, we had over 1,100 million pounds of debts to the Americans, completely out of depth in hock in Britain. And the British never found out. And the reason why is because Churchill lied to the British. He never told us that he, would, he had sunk us into bankruptcy by fighting the Second World War for that five years after Hitler's peace offer. The five useless years of war. In fact, when Henry Morgenthau visited him on August the 4th, 1944, for lunch, as I know, because I've got Churchill's appointment book, his desk calendar, I rented it for £5,000 from the man who stole it from him, his bodyguard. When this <laughs> Morgenthau visited him on August the 4th, 1944, Morgenthau says to him, Mr. Prime Minister, how are you planning to break it to the British people that, in fact, they are complete flat broke? And Churchill said, as we know from Roosevelt's, from Morgenthau's own private diary, Churchill said, that is a doleful task that I propose to leave to my Shakesha. <laughs> so he, he, left it to his, he left it to his successor, Henry Clement Attlee, and Clement Attlee, of course, saw, saw, saw no reason at all to tell the British. I told you about the flywheel that keeps on spinning. Nobody has an interest in stopping that flywheel, and so it continues to spin. Clement Attlee never... The British still haven't found out they lost the empire in World War II. So Churchill and Roosevelt meeting on a battleship here in Canadian waters in August 1941. Incidentally, I might mention that not even your own Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, knew they were meeting there in Canadian waters. It was kept secret from him by Mr. Churchill. 
Churchill didn't believe in consulting the Empire Prime Ministers even when he was selling the Empire down the river. On that day, Roosevelt and Churchill signed the deal that in fact uh, led to the dis dissolution of the Ottawa Agreement, Imperial Preference, the foundation on which the Empire was, was built up as a trading concern. <coughs> the Empire vanished. It vanished over the... I'm no, this is what particularly upsets me. When I was born in 1938, the Empire was a going concern, expanding a great force, as Hitler himself said, for world peace and civilization. And yet it suddenly vanished. And it vanished because of the Winston Churchills and the Harold Macmillans of this world. It vanished and the British still haven't found out. If you go to Britain now, as I'm sure some of you occasionally do, or if you meet the English like myself, you will see in our eye the glint of imperial arrogance, the belief that we still have an empire somewhere out there. <laughs> and some of your prime ministers, some of your politicians pander to this British belief. You have that flag. You had that flag until recently. You have your royal this and your crown that. And you, have, you, you help to, to pander to the British belief that the empire is still out there somewhere. The British have never believed, have never realised that the empire has gone. It's mislaid. We're going to get it back. Rather like an old English woman who's gone shopping in Oxford Street and lost her shopping. She's put her shopping bags down with plastic bags with names like Mars and Spencers and Harrods and Selfridges. And she's left it on the number 73 bus and this bus is cruising up and down Oxford Street at this moment in perpetuity. And she's only got to go in due course to the lost property office and she'll get, we've only got to go to the lost empire office and they'll give it all back to us. And the proof that the empire is out there, the proof that the empire is out there is that the tourists from the British Empire, those nice gentlemen with pigmentation problems, those, those tourists from the British Empire are visiting us at this moment. Admittedly, they're not as well believed. Uh, admittedly, they're not as polite and as, as well mannered as we English. We English have a certain gentility about us. It isn't very genteel to throw petrol bombs at our nice English policemen, but that, of course, just confirms us. We put up with it because it is the proof that the empire is still out there. Of course, it's hooey. We lost the empire because we fought a war that had become stupid <coughs> from 1940 onwards. And if you people say, and if the people outside in the street say, David Irving, how can you spout this heresy about making peace in 1940 with that arch devil, Adolf Hitler? Then the answer is, it isn't just David Irving who's saying we could have made peace on June the 23rd, 1940. Winston Churchill said it. Winston Churchill, in his secret cabinet meeting on June the 23rd, 1940, actually said to his war cabinet, the inner cabinet, I think we would be wrong not to accept the peace offer which Mr. Hitler has made to us, provided that we can secure the necessary guarantees of sovereignty for the empire and the Commonwealth countries. I can see you're hushed by that because now you're realizing I'm not just spouting propaganda at you. If Churchill himself said this on June the 23rd, 1940, why in God's name didn't he go ahead and do the morally courageous thing which was to realize that the war was a lost concern and that by fighting it any longer we couldn't help Poland but we would damage the British Empire which on balance was far more important for the future of the world than what happened to Poland which really was no concern of ours. And why, you may ask, did Churchill not continue and make peace on that day or the next? Well, the answer is that over the next two or three days, you find Churchill considering doing a peace deal with Hitler, with that man, again on June the 23rd, June the 26th, and again on a few days in July. But on each occasion, of course, he's gone home to his uh, bunker in Downing Street under 17 feet of concrete. He's gone home to his bunker and he's slapped himself on the head and he's said to himself, my God, what am I saying? I must be out of my mind. If we make peace with Hitler tomorrow, then I am finished the day after. Winston Churchill would never have been retained as Prime Minister by the British, and Winston Churchill in June 1940 was a man who had only disasters to his name. The Dardanelles conflict, Gallipoli, my father fought in Gallipoli along on, aboard a British Navy battleship, that fiasco. The Chanak crisis of 1927, the Norway fiasco of 1940, in which Churchill himself as First Lord of the Admiralty was responsible by his bungling, which I won't describe here, but by his immense bungling, drunken me meetings of the Admiralty will have played their part, Churchill was responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of British and French and Polish troops in the, in the Narvik campaign of 1940. And of course, by June 1940, he had seen France completely overrun in a few weeks by Hitler, and he himself had masterminded the bungling, disgraceful debacle of Dunkirk. And I could justify those adjectives too, but of course, we're running out of time. The war would still see further, further fiascos at Churchill's hand. In 1941, he masterminded the Tobruk defeat. He masterminded Tripoli. He masterminded Greece. He masterminded Crete. He masterminded all these fiascos. He himself presided over these meetings, and we know how they were conducted because Robert Menzies, the Canadian Prime Minister, the Australian Prime Minister, attended and kept the detailed diary. And in August 1942, I know this is a deep concern to you Canadians. Winston Churchill was personally responsible for the decision to invade at Dieppe, to land allied British, British in quotation marks, troops at Dieppe. They were always called British, but of course, as you Canadians know, most of the troops who were given the job of landing on the beaches at Dieppe were Canadian. 
and not many came back. The reason not many came back, I can reveal to you now, and it's going to be in the Churchill biography, and nobody has ever published this fact before, is that the Germans knew that the target was going to be Dieppe. They knew that the Canadians were coming, and they knew where to expect them, and they were ready. I've got all the German intelligence material relating to this. And far more insidious, not only did the Germans know that Dieppe was going to be the target of that landing, that amphibious raid, we knew that the Germans knew in advance. And yet we still went ahead and landed on Dieppe. And I will tell you the source of this. It is document SRH 013 in the National Archives, United States, a history of the British and American ultra code breaking effort where they give the Dieppe example as one, where we intercepted the German Air Force signals in which it became explicitly clear that the Germans were anticipating an amphibious landing at Dieppe on that day. And you won't find that in any of the Allied official histories, and you know why. Because, of course, I mentioned to you that the official historians were never told about Ultra and the code-breaking effort. But as a matter of deep concern for you Canadians, I know to know that Churchill insisted that the Dieppe raid go ahead, although the Germans knew when and where the Canadians were going to land. And if you want to know why, therefore, the Canadians were sacrificed, I will give you another clue which I have now from the Russian files, because the Russians, too, have helped this arch-fascist and neo-Nazi David Irving to write the history of the Second World War. They've given me complete access to their records of their meetings with Winston Churchill during the pre-war and wartime years, right up to the Potsdam meeting. I have all the records of their secret meetings with Churchill in the Russian language, which leave out, as you can imagine, quite a lot that is not contained in the British archives. And on this particular occasion, we find a few weeks before Dieppe, Winston Churchill telling the Soviet ambassador in London privately, who was complaining that the British were not doing enough to help the Second Front and to help the Russians in their misery in the run-up to the Stalingrad campaign, of course, Star uh, Churchill said, I'm proposing an operation shortly which may well lead to the loss of 50,000 Allied lives. But even if it costs the lives of 50,000 Allied troops, it will be worthwhile if it shows to the uh, uh, Soviet government that we are on their side, body and soul. And even if the operation is a fiasco, he explicitly said that, even if it costs 50,000 lives and is a failure, it will be worthwhile. And this is just a few weeks before the Dieppe operation. So you begin to see the true history of the Second World War, which is being kept from you Canadians too. It's a scandalous episode, and I can understand well that if I had a Canadian publisher, at this point the Canadian publisher might well put his head in his hands and turn the manuscript back to me and say, David Irving, we can't accept this manuscript. It's telling the Canadian public things that they don't want to be told. But I think that there is a section of the Canadian public who very much wants to be told about this.